Let's move on and talk about observing in the field. When we do field observation work, we have to embrace the idea that it is not about us, it's about the people we're observing. So here's an idea to share with you. How do you find out what people really need? Well, you forget about your problems and you worry about theirs. It's really easy for me to say that. It's very hard for me to do that. And we get better and better at this with practice. We say that we observe with curiosity and empathy. These are the two primary qualities of good field observation. Curiosity, we are actually interested. And empathy, we're able to put ourselves in the position of the people that we're working with, to authentically understand the life that they're living. There is an arc to uh, a field interview, and it's much like a relationship. You meet someone, you develop trust and comfort with small talk and introductory pleasantries, and then you rise up this arc to find the real important questions you're working on. It's, it's a relationship. And when practiced well, your interviewee will share with you the deepest parts of their lives. When we are doing this work, this observation work, we focus on three principal areas of a product or a service or even of a company. Use, usability, and meaning. I'll talk briefly about each one of these. First is use. Use is the basic functionality of a product. There are explicit needs. There are tasks to be solved. A knife needs to cut through an apple. It has to accomplish this job with a minimum of difficulty and hardship for the user. There's usability. And usability represents certain aspects of the product, in this case, that allow it to be physically handled. It, uh, a knife shouldn't weigh 50 pounds. It should be lightweight enough to be handled by the smallest hands, yet firm enough to do the job well. And good products have a cognitive sense about them that you don't need a, a user's manual to understand how to use them because they're designed so well that their use becomes obvious. Now, the third part of this triangle of ideas, use, usability, and meaning. Meaning is the most difficult to understand and the one that's most often ignored when companies are producing products and services. The meaning piece looks at and understands the product or service in the context of the whole life of the people that we are talking with. I think often about a universal remote. If you're like me, you have three or four or five of these devices sitting around your TV. Each one has 30 to 40 buttons. All put together, you probably have 200 buttons to, to move, to uh, select, and, and to play uh, various media on your big screen at home. If you're like me, you use about four of those. On, off, forward, backward, volume up, volume down. The meaning of all of those buttons is bewildering. The company that comes out with the three-button universal remote will have understood the meaning of that object and solved a critical consumer issue. Frustration, repetition, and non-understanding. Well, that brings us to the end of the segment on observation. When we come back, we'll talk about insight. The next of the four phases is called the insight phase. Here, we're finding meaning in all of the data we've collected in the observation phase. Meaning being qualitative new learnings that we've been able to see by virtue of collecting all of the field work and related uh, research data. So let's jump into the 
insight phase of work. First, what is an insight? We've all heard the word. We use a particular set of definitions in this work that I'll go over briefly with you right now. Obviously, the act of seeing deeply, of the penetrating look, of the new understanding, looking under the skin, seeing deeper and further than we've looked before, is an important aspect of an insight. It's the power of acute observation, of acute rational observation, filling in not the blanks in the story from our experiences, but understanding those of the users that we've been interviewing. There are big, big insights that we might have all had in the course of our lives. We sometimes call them epiphanies. And they are some, those earth-shattering new ideas that come along. In doing the innovation work process, process work, we probably have lower scale insights in general. But every so often, something will come along and change the way you think about something. That's the goal of the insight phase is to be able to see something that we looked at one way very differently, a new way of seeing, a new insight and knowledge as a result of it. Well, you might ask, why do insights matter? And that's a good question. Let me try to answer. This work is about creating competitive advantage in the context of business. Once we know something our competitors don't know, an unmet need in a customer base, we then have a new opportunity, a new window of opportunity with which to create products, services, new businesses, new strategies that can serve our newly discovered unmet need or white space. When a company is able to do that and design new products and services, introduce them to the market, they are, in competitive strategic terms, able to operate and sell that service or product at premium first mover prices. And they're not competing in the commoditization or the race to the bottom of pricing. And that's why companies like Apple or GE are always selling their goods and services at higher price points than the later entry competitors, the copycat. There are four principal strategies that I would like to introduce to you about how we get to insights, how we discover them. The first one is finding the things that are not obvious. This is a fun quick story about the advent of pull-up disposable diapers. They work the same way as tape on the side diapers. But field work revealed that young parents were stressing out about whether or not their kids were potty trained. Pull-ups were discovered not for the babies, but for the new parents who could say, oh no, my kid is not in diapers. She's wearing pull-ups, thus conferring on them a better status of parenthood. This sounds a little funny, but the pull-up market is a $2.6 billion segment today. So by finding the things that aren't obvious, we often find products and services that weren't obvious until we invent them. Another strategy of getting to insights is explaining patterns in data. With the fabulous data visualization tools we now have access to, we can tell a story with a visualization and understand data in a much more visible and usable way. If this data about global migration was simply a large Excel spreadsheet, it would be very difficult to extract meaning from. Another strategy is to create hypotheses around the why. In this case, a story from Zynga, the game company, giving data about a recent quarterly performance. Now, we can have lots of hypotheses around what's going on in Zynga, from marketplace changes to changes in their demographic player base, customer base, or maybe the quality of their product is going down. All of those hypotheses, which we can test, become the beginnings of insight. Another use of insight is to make sense out of contradictions. I don't know if you're like me, but when someone asks me if I look both ways before crossing the street, I say, sure. 
If you've seen me cross the street recently, you might see me texting as I go, not looking anywhere but forward. And we say, well, you do one thing and you say something else. What's up with that? It's not the idea that I'm a liar, but trying to understand why would he say he looks both ways and then not? And the answer in this case is, I want you to think of me as a good citizen. Well, there's the basis of an insight. We can also find contradictions in data. This is a story from the New York Times Magazine about how leaders of companies say one thing about a simplified tax code, but they spend their money and influence combating the very thing they're promoting. Now, does that make them bad? No, it makes it interesting. And we find meaning in that contradiction. So what we do with this process, just a quick review of it, is that we observe what people do, we listen to the stories that people tell us, we look for the gaps between what people say and what people do, and then we ask why. The answer to that question is always interesting, powerful, and gives us new views into the needs and performance of our customers and our products. One last idea about the insight-making phase. It's very much an ambiguity-filled process. And in the end, what we're trying to do is to find the simplicity that lives on the far side of the complexity of field research. People often describe this phase as a frustrating time of no clarity, and they're right. The task is to continue working through all of the data until we get to that far side of complexity and see the insight, see the simple new learning that we find by going through this work. In our next phase, we'll talk about the ideation process. The third phase of the innovation cycle is the ideation process. We begin the ideation process when we have formulated a useful design imperative question, what we call a how might we question. Based on the insight phase and the observation phase, we've now framed in the real issue we're working on. We call this the problem finding moment. And once we've been able to state the problem, then we can go about finding the solution. And that's what this phase is about, is generating ideas and choosing them. We use different, lots of different techniques for idea generation. We'll talk a little bit about those in a moment. The driving principle of this is a, is a quote from Dr. Linus Pauling, the Nobel Prize scientist, who worked uh, in the 50s and 60s, mostly around the chemistry of vitamin C. You may remember him. He said this, the best way to have a good idea is to have lots of ideas. And so we have developed processes and techniques to have lots of ideas from which to choose the good ones. It looks like this. We looked earlier at this diverge-converge diagram. And in the divergent phase of idea generation, we operate on the left side of that, or the generate options phase. It looks a little bit like this. We have six rules for generating ideas. The first one is to defer judgment. And if you come away from this viewing with any idea that you retain, I hope it is to defer judgment. In generating ideas, we often are so quick to judge that ideas simply go away. Have you ever had the experience of having a, an exciting idea and then not share it with your work group or your team because you think they will think you're too fuzzy or nutty or crazy? I certainly have, and this is the business I'm in. So we work hard to defer judgment. 
until it's time to judge, which is the next phase or the converge phase. We strive for quantity, as we've talked about. We seek wild and unusual ideas, not just because we like to be wild and unusual. But if we're not going to seek wild and unusual ideas, why are we doing this work? If we just will end up back where we started by not pressing out the boundaries. We build on other ideas and we use visual thinking. We draw, we sketch. Drawing and sketching ignite a different part of the frontal cortex and it's a whole new vocabulary of learning. I want to talk for a moment about this principle that's on the screen now. We design for the extreme and we test at the mean. And simply what that means is at the edge of any normal bell curve there are smaller samples with extreme needs. If we solve one of those needs on the extreme and then test it in the big middle, we often are able to find products and services that we couldn't see in the large center of a, of a distribution of people. But by going to the edges, we find these needs and these situations and these solutions. Let me give you an example. You may know of OXO Good Grip kitchen tools. Many people have these in their kitchen, peelers, can openers, spatulas. They have these wide, thick rubber handles. The extreme use case was the inventor's wife who had painful arthritis. Even though she loved to cook, it was hurting her. And so the quest was to create comfortable tools for the hand of an arthritic cook, designed at the extreme. When it was tested at the mean, all of us who don't have arthritis love these tools because they're comfortable and they're easy to use. Another example of designing at the extreme and testing at the mean is this three-legged cup. You may have seen these in stores. Uh, they're a recently launched product designed by an 11-year-old girl. What was the extreme case there? Her beloved grandpa had Parkinson's disease, and his hand shook mightily when he tried to put a cup down, often spilling it. It broke her heart, and she asked, how might we create a cup that Grandpa can use? Well, not only Grandpa, but, but babies, children, parents, kids all over the place are now using three-footed uh, cups instead of having them fall over. In order to get to this series of questions, we craft from our insights what we call a how might we question. The how might we question is the question we can answer with lots and lots of different potential solutions. In creating a how might we question, there's a particular Goldilocks moment to that. I'm going to play you a quick video now from an IDO designer who shares his insight about how might we questions. When we invite people to brainstorm with us, we create how might we questions. We do this so often, we have to shorten it. We call how might we simply HMWs. Let me give you an example. Right now I'm working on creating new bathrooms for India. So what about the question, how might we redesign public toilets in India? Well, that's a little bit wide. Let's try to narrow it. What about, how might we create a doorknob for Indian toilets that's clean, safe, and invites people in? Wow, so this was a little too narrow. Let's find an in-between. How might we create a sense of safety in public toilets? Well, that works. See, it takes a little bit, but this one allows the right amount of creative freedom. So when we go about ideation or creating multiple solutions, we always do some warm-ups beforehand. Because like an athlete getting ready to run a track meet, you don't run out and run cold. You warm yourself up. Well, our brains, our creative brains, need to be warmed up too. So we go through lots of different exercises. Sometimes we sketch. This is a bunch of corporate CFOs, by the way. Other times we play games of creating multiple uses for an a, a offbeat problem. 
We often will warm up a whole team using ball toss exercises, sounds, and stories. This is one of my favorite, where we do product generation by passing the ball off to four people. The first person names a new product. The second person describes the need that that product satisfies. And the third tells us how it satisfies that need, while the fourth creates the marketing tagline name. These kinds of exercises and warm-up pieces condition people for the work ahead, which is idea generation. And we use multiple strategies for doing this. There are hundreds of them that we deploy whatever our situational needs might be. But all of them uh, use different aspects of our mental faculties to stimulate new ideas. For example, humor is a very useful tool in this work because it creates a lightheartedness and a lighter, faster energy, which is helpful in idea generation. Metaphors are an important tool. The metaphor for the original uh, Apple desktop computer was a sunflower. And you can see the relationship between the two. Metaphors give us access to a new area of imagination, like a tempest in a teapot. A metaphor that gives you a sense of bounded up energy. Steve Jobs famously said that computers are like a bicycle for our minds. And an Apple computer is a very different idea and a very different execution than some other uh, laptops that we all probably know and often use. The principle behind all of this ideation is the magic of constraints. Each time we use one of our idea generation techniques, we might generate 30 or 40 ideas from it, and then our mind runs dry. So we'll deploy a new technique, a new strategy, and it slightly changes the nature of the problem each time, tricking our brain into thinking it's solving a different uh, challenge. And that way, we're able to continuously refresh our imaginations and solve these newly constrained problems, still contributing to the overall volume of ideation and ideas, potential solutions that we can then choose from as we go forward into the next part of the ideation phase, which is to choose, to converge, to group together all of, our idea, all of our ideas, select the very best ones for inclusion into the fourth phase or the experimenting phase. Oftentimes, our best technique for making these choices is something called dot voting, which is a very simple tool that is very efficient for getting to the best ideas that we've generated. And as the screenshot shows you, we do it very quickly and very simply. I often say, vote like you're in Chicago. Vote early and vote often. The ideation phase yields hundreds and hundreds of ideas. When we converge down to those that we think are most promising, we move them into the next phase that we'll talk about in just a moment. The fourth and final phase of the innovation process is called the experiment phase. And here, we take all of the ideas that we feel are promising from the ideation phase, and we experiment with them. We test them. We build prototypes with them. We tell stories about them. Let me talk a little bit about these activities. But first, the question, why prototype? Prototypes give us rapid learning at low cost, and reveal aspects of the product or service that in our ideation thus far, we simply haven't thought about. So by sharing them with other people and getting their feedback, we're able to learn more about the ideas that we think are good. So when we ask this question of prototyping, we're looking for three things. We're looking for feasibility. Can we build it? We're looking for viability. Will people buy it? And we're looking for desirability. Will people love it? So if we can answer yes through testing to all three of these questions, we're well on the way to creating a good product or service that we can refine, 
continue to prototype, build out into production models, and test with test marketing. Well, what is a prototype? They come in lots of shapes and sizes. I'm going to quickly run through some of these options. There's a big difference between having someone imagine a product and experience it. Here's a description that I won't read of a new medical device connecting elderly people with their doctor using a simple interface. If you read through this, you'll see that it's perfectly rational and you can create an image of it in your mind. But if you experience this same thing, you can see your customer, your potential user, interacting with it in real time, giving you much more information about not just imagining it in its static form, but seeing it in action. Rapid prototypes are often made very quickly with very few materials that are just sitting around the room. This prototype you see on the screen eventually inspired the following device. It is a medical device that was first thought to not be useful because the association of putting a gun in one's mouth, it's a dental cleaning device, so turned off the uh, client group that they couldn't even think about it. But by using the vehicle of the rapid prototype, they were able to get that preconception out of the way and move on to a successfully introduced medical device. We talk a lot about the $100 prototype. How might we simulate a good or service and test it at low cost to see if it's desirable, viable uh, in the eyes of users? This was an example of a, of a mock-up of uh, people brewing coffee behind the scenes in what looked like a vending machine. All right. Prototypes can also be in the form of business model canvases, of journey maps, 3D printed uh, uh, samples. The list goes on and on. But in all cases, what we're trying to do is test three things. Does this idea inspire people? Does it evolve the concept? And does this prototype validate our thinking or challenge our thinking? Stories are another important use of prototyping and experimenting of an idea. Our colleague here at Haas, David Reamer, says, in order to tell a great story, you have to have a great story. Well, there's common sense, isn't it? We've mapped this idea onto our innovation process diagram, and we say that the problem finding phase the left half of your screen, is figuring out what the new story is. And the other side is figuring out how to tell a new story, the experimentation phase. I showed you earlier the OXO Good Grips uh, product line. And the distilled story, the small, simple, powerful story of OXO goes something like this. Betsy loved to cook, but it hurt. So Sam asked, why do ordinary kitchen tools have to hurt your hands? Why can't they be wonderfully comfortable and easy to use? OXO Good Grips. The use of stories in business and in marketing and in companies is legendary around this particular piece of marketing. It's the most popular campaign of the 21st century. You know what it is. It's the Apple iPod. The important idea behind this is that companies build features, so much storage space, audio controls, this and that. Customers are seeking the benefits. In the case of the iPod, it was, I just want to be cool like everybody else. Of course, I bought one. It didn't make me any more cool, but I still love that device. This is the last segment in our hour-long tutorial around design thinking and innovation. In this segment, I want to talk not about the tools and techniques as much as about the activity and our own mental models of how we go about doing this work. As we walked through the four phases of the innovation process, we used many different tools, 16 of them as a matter of fact, and there are 1,600 more that we could have brought to bear on ideation, on insight generation, and on experimentation. But the ideas are all 
wrapped up in these final thoughts. That the innovation process and the design thinking tools compile what is a discovery process. We very much work from the bottom up. We begin with the beginner's mind of saying, I don't know the answer, but I'll find out. And that's what this process is designed to do. It's not necessary to use the innovation process on every single issue or problem or challenge. A top-down or hypothesis-driven model works very well for quality improvement, supply chain clarification, for uh, small incremental efficiency gains. But when we're working on a larger scale problem of deeper consequence, we often use the innovation process, a way to discover our way forward. This process is highly focused on understanding customer or user experience and needs. And as I mentioned earlier, it is through this process of understanding what we don't yet know that gives us the opportunity to find white space, to find new product opportunities, and to exploit them. This process, the innovation process, the design thinking tools, sometimes feels fuzzy or um, lightweight or soft skill based. But it's not. It's a clearly defined, disciplined, and repeatable process. I often describe it as we create strong process riverbanks so that the water can flow freely and smoothly through it. We depend on process to build the path through all of the ambiguity, all of the uncertainty, and what feels oftentimes like chaos of the innovation cycle. I'd like to close with five ideas that for me frame in the human side of being an innovationist using these processes. The first one is learn by doing. We really don't have an answer when we begin and we learn our way forward. But we don't learn our way forward by reading books. We learn our way forward by engaging with customers, engaging with ideas, engaging with prototypes, and continuously learning the whole way. The second idea I want to share with you is this, that curiosity is better than judgment. I would suggest this is true in all areas of life, <laughs> but in the innovation process in particular, judgment is the enemy. Curiosity is the friend. If we keep an open mind to the possibilities and not worry about what has come before or what other people might think, we often find that the unthinkable is the great new success. The third idea is to get better solutions, ask better questions. Humans are terrific problem solvers. But sometimes we're solving the wrong problem, which is why we put great emphasis on problem finding in the innovation process. Because once we get the question right, the answer comes quite fast. The fourth idea is to listen to your instincts. Now, I teach in a business school where we value quantitative ideas and linear processes highly. And we also listen to our instincts in doing innovation work. That small, quiet voice at times that says, mm, I think that's worth going after. That gut check that says, I like that idea somehow. So there's a, an aspect of creative courage in this work. Listening to your instincts gives you visibility to those ideas. And the last idea is this one. I mentioned the power of the riverbanks. I've talked about the process. And our, our process, our only way of moving forward, is to trust the process and to do the work. Not one or the other, but both. I've gone through this cycle literally thousands of times. And every time I lose my way, 
I go back and I think, what do you teach about? You teach people to trust the process and to do the work. And when I trust the process and do the work, the results come out fabulously strong, courageously creative, and fulfilling unmet human needs along the way. Thank you for spending time with me and these ideas, and I hope you have a path ahead that is full of innovation and curiosity and happiness. Thank you. My name is Andrew Isaacs. I'm the faculty director for this program. Welcome back. I'd like to share a few thoughts with you regarding Professor Cooper Smith's lecture on business models. In the lecture that follows, you'll be examining what we mean not only by the term business models, but how we use business models to disrupt pre-existing businesses. Here's what I mean by that. A business model, of course, is how we take a value proposition, meaning how we uh, create value, and bring it to market, meaning how we deliver a, vi a business model to consumers or to other businesses that pay money for the transaction that takes place between buyer and seller. So that's what business models are all about. But disruptive business models have opened up a new world of opportunity in the present day, particularly based on technology. The rapid development of new technologies, especially information technology, has opened up new business models that were not previously available to us. So look for business model disruption and business model innovation over the course of the lecture that's about to start. The second thing I'd like you to pay special attention to is the concept of MVP, minimum viable product. MVP is, a, is indeed a new concept in innovation because we've seen a shift over the past 30 or 40 years from innovation being fundamentally for businesses to, be innovation, to being innovation that's fundamentally for consumers. The reason is because we can now innovate in uh, many different ways te and test those innovations in consumer markets that would not, if, they had, if the introduction had been into business markets, would not have tolerated the introduction of incomplete products. The term minimum viable product indeed implies an incomplete product, a product that's not fully tested, fully validated, fully featured, fully rendered, fully complete. That's a relatively new innovation for businesses themselves. Now here in Silicon Valley, in the past year or two, we've come to craft a new equation that simply says MVP equals P. It is the product. The products that we ship, deliver, uh, provide to our customers, indeed, are always MVPs. They're always minimally viable products. Some of the most famous new product innovations, for example, the Tesla automobile, are designed specifically to be incomplete when delivered because the consumer of a Tesla automobile, the buyer, is willing to accept the incompleteness of that product, knowing that software updates and enhancements will be delivered for free over the lifetime that the, of the vehicle itself, over the course of ownership. The result is that, for example, the first production Tesla Model S, which was two, uh, 2013 model year, still driving today, behaves as a different vehicle than it did when it was shipped from the factory three years ago. Well, that's a striking change in automobile engineering, but it reflects other forms of consumer uh, innovation as well. For example, your iPhone 
behaves differently three months after you buy it based on automatic up updates that come, and you've come to expect that. So MVP has come to equal P. The products that we are now uh, accepting and in fact expecting our uh, uh, innovative uh, uh, companies to provide us with are in fact minimally viable at the time we make the purchase. I hope you enjoy the lesson that follows. Hi, I'm Mark Cooper Smith. I'm senior fellow and lecturer at the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley, where I teach innovation and entrepreneurship to graduate students and executives here at Berkeley and around the world. Today in our ongoing series, online series of innovation and entrepreneurship, I will be focusing on business models. And I'm going to take a kind of an interesting, broad approach to introducing this particular topic. First of all, in our first of three sections, I'll be talking about definitions and approaches. What is a business model? Why do we care? What are some different ways to look at it? Number two, in our second section, I will introduce you to several particular approaches to defining, documenting, and innovating business models. That will include things like the business model canvas or the business model navigator. And in the third section, we'll do some examples, a couple of exercises, and then we'll put these to work through a process called customer discovery, where not only do we address product market fit for new products, whether they're coming out of innovative entrepreneurial ventures or larger organizations, but we'll also take a look at business model iteration and evolution. And remember, in this fast-paced world, if your business model doesn't continually look for ways to evolve, if your leadership team isn't stressing your business model and looking to evolve it, chances are somebody else is, and, well, your profitability and sustainability may be short-lived. Let's figure out how we get around that, shall we? First section, definitions and approaches to business models. And we're going to start really at the simplest level. I'm going to ask you to think about your organization. Say, what is its business model? What is a business model? Think about those elements. Well, at its simplest, what a business model is, is it's a narrative or a story or a description of how an organization derives revenues, how an organization creates the resources that it needs to be sustainable. If we dive a little bit deeper, we can take a look at these. It's a description about what an organization does to create value, how it does it, and in particular, how does it make money and become sustainable? Now, in my definition, I've added in parentheses, at least for a while. And the reason I did really talks back to my opening comments, which is, Business models are changing faster and faster as the pace of business picks up, as competition comes in, not just from nearby, but from halfway around the world and from other sectors as well. So you've constantly got to be looking to evolve your business model. The other thing that a business model does is that it addresses key relationships between really the important and relevant, those that are most involved stakeholders of an organization and its products and services. Who are we talking about? In addition to those inside the organization, of course, we're talking about customers. We're talking about partners. We're talking about your channel and suppliers and all the other stakeholders that really are involved in the creation of value, and in the generation of revenues for your organization. Now, that's a definition. If we were to flip it around and say, what questions does a business model address? I'd like to go back to one of the preeminent business thinkers of the 20th century, Peter Drucker. And 
Even before this concept of business models, this term was coined, Peter Drucker was talking about his theory of business. And when he talked about his theory of business, he asked three key questions. Who is the customer? What does the customer value? And how do we, as an organization, make money in addressing those first two questions? Let's flip that around and look at it yet one more way, shall we? An effective business model defines and describes how an organization accomplishes three critical objectives. How does it create value for its customers? How does it deliver value to its customers? And how does it capture value for the organization? Let's pause and I'll give you an example or two. Let's look at transportation. Let's say we have a customer who has a need to get from point A to point B. So the customer's need is clear. Now, there are a number of ways that we might look at that, and each of them has a different model attached to it. If we look at a traditional approach to meeting that need, let's look at a car company, say BMW. How does BMW meet that need, create value for customers? Well, it provides customers with a car. How does it deliver that value to the customers? Well, not only is it delivering that value through the car, but it also requires an extensive dealer and service network in addition to the car itself to be able to deliver that value to customers. Number three, how does it capture value for the organization? Well, that's not that hard, is it? It sells the automobile for more money than it costs for BMW to make the car. There's the solution, there's the business model. Let's look at it from a different perspective, perhaps a more contemporary perspective. We have that same customer seeking transportation. Uber provides a very different approach. How does it create value for the customers? Well, it provides a ride for that customer, transportation for that customer, not in his own car, but rather in somebody else's car. How does Uber deliver that value to customers? Well, through its mobile app, it provides or makes available drivers and their cars to those customers in a timely manner and in a way that the customer knows exactly what he's going to pay to move from point A to point B. How does it capture value for the organization? Uber makes a commission on every transaction or every trip that is arranged through its app. Same problem, same ability ability to move a customer or a user from point A to point B, although in a very different way, and a fundamentally different business model. In fact, when we look at business models, my good friend Guy Kawasaki, who's a startup guru and has written extensively on startups and entrepreneurship, says this, a customer is someone who temporarily has my money. The role of a good business model is to help ensure that that money comes home to me, that that money makes its way into my pocket. Now that we have a good definition of what a business model is, at its most basic, it's that story of who's the customer, what need do they have, how do we meet that need with products and services, what processes do we use, and how do we then deliver and extract value for ourselves as an organization. That's our basic model. Now we're going to go ahead and take a look at some specific examples, somewhat similar to but in more depth to the transportation example that we used in that earlier section. By the way, if we look back at that example, if you're Ford and there are now services in place that can replace the need or get rid of the need for your customers to buy a car, you've got to be pretty worried about that. In fact, General Motors recently acquired the assets of a ride-sharing service called Sidecar in San Francisco to better understand how sidecar operated incorporate some of that competency inside GM so that GM can also do a better job 
in building new business models and possibly different products that meet that need. I'm going to go on for one more minute here. Daimler-Benz did much the same in its new service in Europe called Car2Go. So you may be familiar with that. Daimler-Benz is creating new cars and new services that are specifically focused on ride sharing and other types of more innovative transportation approaches that utilize cars but don't utilize necessarily the traditional business model of selling cars to individual drivers. Anyway, let's move on. So, as we take a look at driving innovation across the board, what areas can we innovate? Where do we create value through innovation? And there's three areas that we can do that. I'm going to lean in as I'm going to draw on the board here. The first area where we can think about innovation is in the area of products and services, right? We always, we typically think about innovation taking place there, new products, next generation, etc. The second area where we drive value through innovation is in processes, new manufacturing models, new channels, new service models, and we create value through doing at its most basic one of two things. Either we create a more efficient process which drives costs out of the way that we create the products or deliver the services, therefore by being more efficient, creating higher margins, or we add more value. Our processes add more value, which enable us to charge more for those goods and services. So that's the second way. The third way that we add value is really the core topic of this particular module, and that is we innovate in our business models themselves. So those are the three areas of innovation that we're looking at. And we'll see that across this entire online course. Now, let's take a look at some specific examples around innovation across all of these. And also in particular, let's take a look at the business model innovation. So here's a retailer we all know, IKEA, global retailer, phenomenally successful, and from its founding decades ago has really grown around a consistent business model. And what's that business model? Creating great, high quality, low cost furniture in large warehouses. Now, what's so different about that? We've really grown up with that, but there are a number of areas that IKEA fundamentally innovated. And let's break that down based on some of the criteria that we used in our initial definitions. Number one, if we look at Peter Drucker's three questions, who is the customer? IKEA knows who its customer is. It's often a younger individual or couple or someone clearly on a budget that values compact furniture that's good quality but may not need to last incredibly long, and that is um, contemporary and stylish. And how does IKEA make money? Well, IKEA makes money by delivering exactly those products, compact furniture, contemporary and stylish, in a very efficient format, um, which is these large big box retailers and showrooms where customers actually walk out the door with the furniture in most cases and then assemble it themselves. So how does IKEA really make, you know, how do all these innovations create value in a lot of ways? So do they innovate in the three core areas that we've talked about, product, process, and business model? You bet. Product. Because of their desire to create lower cost, can still stylish and contemporary furniture, IKEA looked at a number of different ways to create the product itself. And they came up with particle board as the most cost effective and efficient, highly efficient because there's very little scrap because they remold all of that. And as we move into process, they also can pack it very tightly 
because of the way that they have designed manufacture. And of course, another part of the process is that the customer assembles the products themselves or they pay somebody else to assemble those products. The business model is such that um, IKEA has driven huge efficiencies in their design, procurement, and delivery process. If we think about it, it's completely integrated vertically across so many, you know, the entire value chain. Um, and it has customers do much of the work. Customers come to the store, they take the product home, and they do the installation, driving much efficiency and because of the packaging. In fact, IKEA sells so much furniture this way and uses so much particle board that it's become one of the largest consumers of wood in the world. IKEA consumes close to 1% of the wood that is used in these types of applications globally. Major changes in all three of those, which helps explain their ongoing success. Now, IKEA grew up with a version of that business model and evolved it over time. But longer lasting companies have to evolve or they will find that their business model and their products and services are no longer relevant and they'll go out of business. So what's a great example? IBM is a great example. In fact, IBM used to stand for International Business Machines. Right now, the letters IBM just stand for IBM, but earlier they were International Business Machines because their first products were truly business machines like typewriters shown here. Now, over time, especially with the advent of computers, the typewriter started to become obsolete, and IBM moved into the computer business. And IBM, at the time, moved into the computer business when computers were large mainframe and mini computers that took up entire rooms. And they created and sold and leased these products and also provided services around them. But then, as computers continued to become smaller and smaller, and as the way that we use computers changed, IBM evolved and moved into the personal computer business. And they were one of the global leaders in personal computers. Until that market also started to become commoditized, and they sold that off. So the IBM business is now owned by Lenovo on the laptop and computer side, and increased their global services and high-level, high-value-added consulting business. So take a look at the change in business models from selling typewriters to offering global corporations consulting services on a global basis. IBM certainly has changed all three of those areas of product, process, and their business model. Now, this innovation and evolution of business occurs across all different types of sectors. So I want to take a look at one other example. Let's take a look at Nestle and consumer products. Think about the way that Nestle used to sell coffee. It used to sell coffee like this, Nescafe, through traditional channels. Until several decades ago, they started innovating on all three of those areas again, product, process, and business models, and they developed Nespresso. Think about an espresso. So you own the machine, which Nestle makes less money on, by the way. But then each of those little pods is phenomenally, those coffee pods with different flavors and for different types of coffee, is phenomenally profitable for Nestle. In fact, the coffee in those pods is more than 10 times as expensive as most bulk, bulk coffee is. But Nestle's created a great product and also a fundamentally different business model where they have a direct relationship and franchise with their customers because of the replenishment. Massive change in the way they look at product, process, and their business model.